give a little uh, uh, preamble, not that you have a choice. Uh, this, this is a little bit different. Uh, it's not a typical research paper because it's, it's a draft of an essay that I've written for the Handbook of Pentecostal Theology, which uh, Wolfgang Fondi is currently editing. Uh, so it's a, little, it's, it's a bit of a different genre. So you'll notice, for example, that I'm not going to really mention scholars' names. Uh, I, I think I have added a couple in in the introduction just to sound smart, but... Uh, so, I, I, you know, I'm used to saying so-and-so so says this and so-and-so and, -so and kind of comparing and contrasting and such. And I do have people in brackets here in citations, but uh, for this particular genre, my understanding was that I wasn't really supposed to do that. But my hope is that that will help us to focus more on the theological content uh, than perhaps some of the discussion. But. So, here we go. For all their talk about the Holy Spirit... One might think that Pentecostals have a well-developed pneumatology, but they do not. Instead, historically, Pentecostal, Pentecostals have tended to focus their discussion of the Holy Spirit on experiences of the Holy Spirit. So dis discussions, pardon me, discussions of spirit baptism, gifts of the Spirit, and things like that. Um, now... I don't mean to suggest that Pentecostals neglect pneumatology altogether. In fact, I would say Pentecostals make it clear that the Spirit belongs everywhere in pneumatology or in, in theology in general. So if you pick up, for example, a copy of uh, Renewing, what is it called? Renewing Christian Theology by Amos Young. Uh, if you look at the table of contents, the Spirit's all over the chapters, but there's no chapter specifically on the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, he's kind of constrained because he's following the World Assemblies of God uh, fellowship statement of faith, but still, it's noteworthy. So as a result, or pneumatological theology, which focuses on exploring how pneumatology might affect or supplement other doctrines, is a predominant paradigm among Pentecostal theology today. In light of this, I could rightly describe Pentecostal pneumatology primarily with the references to the ways that Pentecostals have made pneumatological contributions to ecclesiology, soteriology, theology of religions, and every other area of the theological loci. And uh, Peter Alto says an essay coming out in the TNT Clark Companion in Pneumatology at some point in the next year or two, and I looked at it, what he had written, and that's, that's what he did. But for the handbook, it wouldn't work because there's already chapters on Pentecostal theology of religions and theology of mission and all these things. So I said to Wolfgang, what am I supposed to do? Uh, although I already had an outline at that point. But <laughs> Anyhow, so in this essay, I am specifically concerned with pneumatology proper. And what I mean by that is that this essay explores how Pentecostals have understood the person of the Spirit as such in order to develop a Pentecostal pneumatology proper. And I mean pneumatology proper in distinction from pneumatological theology. So with respect to pneumatology proper, the historical consensus of the church has been that the spirit is divine and a divine person. Pentecostals affirm this historic Christian doctrine, but in their own unique way. In this essay... I argue that Pentecostals regard and experience the Holy Spirit, who Jesus poured out as, at Pentecost, as the divine person who is experienced as the eschatological intensification of the presence of God. I'll say it again. I argue that Pentecostals regard and experience the Holy Spirit, who Jesus poured out at Pentecost, as the divine person who is experienced as the eschatological intensification of the presence of God. So my first section, Experiencing the Spirit of Pentecost. The distinctiveness of Pentecostal theology comes not so much, or I should say Pentecostal pneumatology, comes not so much in its conclusions regarding the divine personhood of the Spirit, but the way in which Pentecostals will reach these conclusions, namely through an emphasis on an experience of the Spirit of Pentecost, Indeed, the theological symbol of Pentecost and the experience of the Spirit are foundational for Pentecostal theology as a whole, and therefore for Pentecostal pneumatology more specifically. 
even though Pentecostals do recognize the work of the Spirit in the Old Testament and the Gospels, Pentecostal pneumatology finds its impetus in the first place from Pentecost, where Jesus poured out the Spirit upon the church. Pentecostals also emphasize the work of the Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ, but this is largely with the aim of re reminding believers that after Pentecost, the Spirit that was upon Christ now rests upon those who have been baptized in the Spirit in order to continue Christ's ministry today. This means that they regard Pentecost not only as a unique event in redemptive history, but they expect that believers today can participate in the ongoing nature of the Pentecostal event as they encounter the Spirit in their own lives. Pentecostals expect to experience not only the quiet guidance of the Spirit, but also more dramatic events like speaking in tongues and miraculous healings. While such theological accents are not absent from other theological traditions, Pentecostals uniquely emphasize their encounters with God through the theological narrative of the full gospel and in their theological articulations of the experience of the Spirit through being baptized in the Spirit and the manifestation of the spiritual gifts. Now in my next section, the person of the Spirit. With the rest of the church, Pentecostals affirm that the spirit they experience is a divine person. First, for Trinitarian Pentecostals, in distinction from Oneness Pentecostals, who deny the doctrine of the eternal imminent trinity, Trinitarian Pentecostals, their understanding of Pentecost leads them to conclude that the spirit is a divine person distinct from the Father and the Son, for they emphasize that after his ascension, Jesus received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, in order to pour out the Spirit on the church. In other words, Jesus is the Spirit baptizer, which means that the Spirit is not simply the spiritual presence of Christ in the world today, but a divine person distinct from the Father and the Son. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, Pentecostals affirm that the Spirit is personal. This is one of the main reasons that Pentecostals are sometimes cautious of the historical tendency of the Western Church to speak of the Spirit as the mutual love of the Father and the Son and the common colori of the filioque. That is, Pentecostals have a deep concern that one should not depersonalize the Spirit. And there I'm using Frank Mackey's words. While the way that they frequently speak of the Spirit as filling people or as the need to, to be refilled with the Spirit might make the Spirit sound kind of like a substance, like gas that you put in a car, Pentecostals also typically emphasize that the Spirit is a divine person with whom one can have a relationship. Believers should be led by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. And while the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed reminds believers that the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets, Pentecostals remind the church that the Spirit continues to speak through prophets, and even directly to individual believers. Next section, the passion of the Spirit. Pentecostals also affirm the personhood of the Spirit in their recognition of the passion of the Spirit. Indeed, an awareness of the Spirit's sigh may be one of the key characteristics of Pentecostal spirituality, and especially as it relates to the practice of speaking in tongues. At times, Pentecostals find a correlation between their personal groaning and the groaning of the Spirit. In such times of prayer, Pentecostals sense the passion of the Spirit. In addition, most Pentecostal systematic theologians affirm that the Spirit suffers, even though we may so show some caution and speak of God as suffering impassably. The Holy Spirit suffers, for example, when grieving from human sin. This Pentecostal emphasis on the passion of the suffering Spirit is yet another way that Pentecostals affirm the personhood of the Spirit. Next section, the Divine Spirit of Power. Pentecostals also affirm that the spirit they experience is fully divine. While the Father is regarded as the transcendent divine person who dwells in heaven, and the Son has ascended to heaven to pour out the spirit at Pentecost, the spirit is now God with us, the one by which God reaches out to the touch the world. This is foundational for both Pentecostal experience and theology. Pentecostals naturally affirm the divinity of the Spirit given the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit, an attribute of divine being. 
Well, the historic creeds appropriate divine om omnipotence to God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Pentecostals tend to associate their current experiences of the Spirit with divine power. Next to John 3.16, the biblical verse most prominent in Pentecostal preaching is Acts 1.8, I'd say. You will receive... Thanks for two. That works too. <laughs> but Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. Pentecostals believe that just as the Spirit ministered in the... Or sorry, just as Jesus ministered in the power of the Spirit as He healed people and drove out demons, the Spirit empowers people today to continue the ministry of Jesus. And this is a divine power. Next section, the divine Spirit of love. Pentecostals also affirm the divinity of the Spirit as they increasingly recognize that the Spirit is the love of God and given that God is love. Numerous biblical texts associate the Spirit with divine love. Romans 5.5, 5, for example, reads, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Some early North American Pentecostals described the baptism of the Holy Spirit not only as experiences of glory and power, but also as a reception of divine love. Similarly, more recent Pentecostal theology, and here I'll quote Amos Young, regards the day of Pentecost outpouring as God's excessive and universal gift of love to the world and in and through, sorry, in and through the gift of the Spirit of God. End of quote there. Given that the Spirit is the love of God to the world, Pentecostals affirm the divinity of the Spirit. Next section, the divine presence of God. Another reason for Pentecostals to affirm the divinity of the Spirit is that they regard their experience of the presence of the Spirit as an experience of the presence of God. Aside from, aside from connecting the omnipresence of God with the Spirit, the scriptures also connect God's presence to the unique ways that the Spirit is present. For example, the Apostle Paul refers to the church as God's temple because God's Spirit is present within it, 1 Corinthians 3. The Spirit's presence is not always obvious in the church, however. And when Pentecostals speak of the presence of the Spirit, they are usually referring to times when they have a heightened sense of the presence of God, particularly during a time of praise and worship. They sometimes refer to this as the manifest presence of God. Furthermore, with respect to glossolalia, as enabled by the Spirit, speaking in tongues becomes the audible medium for realizing the presence of God. Pentecostals affirm their experience of the presence of the Spirit as experiences of God's presence. And this illustrates the unique way that Pentecostals affirm the historic Christian doctrine of the Spirit's divinity. Next section, eschatological presence. Along with affirming the divinity and personhood of the Spirit, Pentecostals regard the Spirit as the eschatological presence of God. Jesus received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, Acts 2.33, in order to pour out the Spirit in the last days, Acts 2.17. The experience of the Spirit is therefore an eschatological experience. The presence of charismatic activity among believers fulfills eschatological expectations concerning the coming of the Spirit from within the Old Testament. Joel anticipated widespread visions, dreams, and prophecy, and these expectations begin to be fulfilled when the Spirit is poured out at Pentecost. When Pentecostals recognize that their experience of the Spirit's presence is eschatological, they are also recognizing that Pentecost raises anticipations of future work of the Spirit. Pentecostals regard the gifts of the Spirit then as eschatological signs of the kingdom of joy where sorrow, death, and sin are put down and banished. And there I'm quoting from Steve Land. As a result of their experiences of Spirit fullness, fullness, at times, Pentecostals can become triumphalistic, expecting complete victory in this life, including lives of health and wealth. When they're at their best, however, Pentecostals recognize that the powers of the age to come are already in some measure present in signs and wonders, but only a measure. As a result, while Pentecostals generally recognize that their prayers will not always result in immediate healing, they still anticipate their eventual full healing 
or redemption of our bodies by, mean of the, by means of the Spirit at the resurrection. Final section, intensifying presence. The Pentecostal anticipation of a greater experience of the Spirit's presence in the future implies that Pentecostals also recognize that the Spirit's presence can intensify. Pentecostals regard the presence of the Spirit as dynamic. The very idea of, quote, Spirit, Ruach, Numa of God, employs, Im, implies movement. The Spirit is the dynamic breath or wind of God that blows wherever it pleases. And the Holy Spirit is poured out like water upon people. These dynamic images of the Spirit support the conclusion that the presence of the Spirit can intensify. The Spirit's presence can intens intensify within the church. The church is clearly a place where the Spirit dwells, for Paul reminded the church in Corinth that you are God's temple and God's, because God's Spirit dwells in you. At the same time, Pentecostals continue to pray for the Spirit to come and work in their midst. The primary way, however, that Pentecostals suggest that the Spirit's presence intensifies is in relationship to individuals. When Pentecostals affirm that the Spirit comes to dwell within believers at the point of their conversion, this is already a moment of the intensification of the Spirit's presence, because there's a sense in which the Spirit is already in all people, even before Pentecost, sustaining their very existence. And yet, a person can still receive the Spirit by believing the Gospel. In this reception, the presence of the Spirit intensifies within a person. Beyond this, Pentecostals frequently describe baptism in the Holy Spirit as an experience that can occur subsequent to the reception of the Spirit at the point of conversion. Spirit baptism, then, represents a further intensification of the Spirit in their lives. And the Spirit may further intensify in them as they continue to be filled with the Spirit. When speaking of Spirit baptism, some Pentecostals would say that there is one baptism and many fillings of the Spirit. Others would say that Spirit baptism is not a one-time experience, but perhaps a process identified with the coming of the Kingdom of God. One that encompasses the Spirit's work in saving, sanctifying, and empowering believers for witness and eventually even a resurrection from the dead by the Spirit at the return of Christ. But regardless of how each Pentecostal defines Spirit baptism, they all imply that believers can continue to experience a greater intensification of the Spirit's presence. Furthermore, some Pentecostal theologians reg would regard this intensification of the Divine Presence as the increasing of the giving, of, as the increasing of the giving away of the Divine Spirit or as a kenosis of the Spirit. To conclude, Pentecostals regard the Spirit as a divine person, inasmuch as they emphasize that people can have a relationship with the Spirit, that the Spirit speaks, and that the Spirit is passionate. And Pentecostals regard the divinity of the Spirit in the Spirit's power and the love of the Spirit. Furthermore, they regard the Spirit's presence as the very presence of God, an intensifying presence that brings both, both eschatological fulfillment and anticipation. And so, to summarize my paper and reaffirm my thesis, Pentecostal theology and experience presents the Holy Spirit as the divine person <coughs> through whom Christians experience the eschatological and intensifying presence of God. Thus ends my presentation. Thank you. Uh, before Brandon gives his paper. Thanks, Andrew. Um, obviously, a, a fair bit of that content um, you would expect to find in any pneumatology proper, as you called it. Mm -hmm. What do you see as Pentecostalism's unique contribution then to not just a pneumatological view of the other areas of systematics, but actually a pneumatology proper? Is there something unique that Pentecostals contribute there? To me, it's not so much the conclusion, but how we get there, right? So it's, uh, you know, if you would read Millard Erickson's theology, you know, he would have section on the spirit as divine, section on the spirit as a person. He probably wouldn't talk so much about the presence of God and the presence of the spirit or even eschatology uh, or the spirit speaking to us and prophecy and spiritual gifts. So to me, it's more, these are the unique ways that we are affirming these things uh, so we, 
I don't want to just say it's the conclusion though, because it is a unique way of seeing and thinking about the Spirit. Even though the overall conclusion is the same. Yes, we agree the Spirit's divine and that the Spirit is a divine person, but these are the unique ways that we regard the Spirit as such. So that's, that's how I think it is unique. Yeah. I think through the body of your paper, you established your point very well, and I think you made your point. Uh, the problem I have is not with the bulk of the paper, but was with the defining statement up front that said that the, uh, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was an intensifying presence. Uh, and it seems to me that more classical Pentecostals would uh, be more comfortable with the word infilling presence. So I think you made your point that the, present can, the, the presence of the Spirit can be experienced in an intensifying in the individual's uh, life and the life of the, of the church in any individual meeting, so on and so forth. I think that's well stated. But an intensification assumes a full reception of the, of the Spirit previous as opposed to an infilling of the Spirit that is something maybe distinct and unique from simply salvation. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so this, I, I'll kind of respond to a little bit of what you said and a little bit of what you have asked uh, at the same time. So uh, I think it was 2010, I was reading Frank Macchia's uh, evaluation of John Levison's book, Filled with the Spirit. And he said something about how, you know, if, if the Spirit's involved in the whole world, this is a bigger problem of subsequence than what Pentecostals have been dealing with. Because we talk about subsequence as, or we tend to, as you, you receive the Spirit, you're, 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 the Spirit dwells in you. There's the code word. The Spirit dwells in you at salvation, but you don't have the fullness yet. And then you get filled with the Spirit, with the subsequent experience of Spirit baptism. And Machia was recognizing in, uh, in John Levison's book that the Spirit's already filling the world. And so if the Spirit's already, and this would be my, I would affirm this, that like uh, Jürgen Moltmann, the Spirit of life kind of idea. If the Spirit's giving us life and breath, then the Spirit's already present, filling the world. And so Trinitarian panentheism, Absolutely. Not, not processed panentheism. <laughs> okay, so Trinitarian panentheism, where the Spirit is and, is and God is present in the whole world, including in unbelievers, sustaining them and giving them life. Then when we become a believer and we receive the Spirit, it's a greater intensification because the Spirit is present and at work in a new way. And so, you know, where you were talking about the, the salvation versus, uh, uh, and sanctification versus sustaining, uh, largely to me it comes down to the, the Spirit is present and active in a different way, um, but in an intensifying way. And so that now we, we do have the Spirit dwelling in us. Like when Paul refers to the church and individuals as the temple of God and the temple of the Spirit, I don't think he meant only a little bit was there until you speak in tongues. Um, but that when we have a post-conversion experience of spirit baptism, there is a greater fullness, but it's not that there wasn't a fullness there before. And so that's why I, I find the intensification uh, metaphor helpful versus, say, a release. Because there is that filling language in the scripture, and so it, it's something that's coming even more from the outside and not just a release of something that's within, although there's that in the scripture too. Um, so that's kind of my thinking there and uh, if you want to read further I did have an article in NUMA I think it was in 2012 uh, called this the intensity of the spirit spirit of creation something something in the spirit filled world and something about spirit baptism uh, so I, I get into it and I define it better there than I had room for here uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, if, again, with respect to intensification, just wondering whether it would be helpful to distinguish between presence and activity. Mm -hmm. You were using them interchangeably, and it might yes. also relate to what Aaron was saying about uh, apocalyptic experiences. Right. So one of my, uh, and you mentioned something about the spirit only when there's, the, I forget how you put it, but something signs, theo, theophanic signs. Theophanic signs. So 
uh, I would actually regard not just those moments as intensification of the Spirit. So when a believer comes to have faith and the Spirit comes and dwells within them in a greater way, they may have no recognition of that. No dramatic sign, but the Spirit is, I would argue, not just active, but also present in a distinct manner, without us being aware. Uh, so I do want to make it, even though I, I am saying work and activity and presence kind of together, I do, I, I'm not just using them, I'm not saying, I'm not using the word presence in place of activity. I actually think that the presence of the Spirit changes. Uh, and so that's why, I forget, uh, that's why I continue to use the word presence anyways. Because I, I actually do think, and even if we're not aware of it, it's not just a manifest. It's not just that we become more aware of the presence of God. Because I would argue, sometimes the Spirit's presence changes in real ways, and we are not aware. And so it says something more about God changing by means of the Spirit than just our awareness. So you are distinguishing, but you're saying there can be intensification of presence as well as intensification of I think they go together, but we're not always aware of them. But I, I guess I just want to say it's not just activity. There actually is a presence changing, too. Mark? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I think one of my questions has to do with Christology. I know you might want to avoid Christology, but you can't. Uh, I think it was Eugene Rogers who said, he had a phrase, anything the Spirit can do, Jesus can do better. Mm -hmm. and, and that was like a parody, really, of how Christology kind of supplants or can supplant. Pneumatology. But I'm still, you know, to move from pneumatology to Trinitarian theology, you, you, you have to go through Christology. You can't go any other way. So is there, a, is there a, um, a space for Christology to help you with the language and the intensity and the differential that you're wanting to, to construct here? Does that help you do what you want to do? Or do you think that's confusing the pneumatological picture? Uh... Well, it depends what you mean by Christology. If, you, if you're thinking about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, absolutely. Because the Reformers had arguments over, is Christ more present here than elsewhere? You know, is there an intensification here of the presence of God? Uh, so I think that is helpful as an analogy to see how this isn't, like, perhaps unique to the Spirit. But I doubt that's probably what you had in mind when you mentioned Christology. Uh, I have to think further about that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I'll, one I'll more note question, that. and then we're going to go on to Brandon's paper, Dave. Um, just, well, one quick comment and then a question. On that question of intensification, it seems to me there's a lot of parallels between what Pentecostals suggest and the Catholic sacraments. So you have baptism for salvation and then confirmation. They describe as a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit where you get the increase of spiritual gifts, increased ability to witness for Christ, all of these sorts of things, this kind of intensification as you're describing. My question was about um, the uh, distinction perhaps between Pentecostal theology and then Pentecostal practice, particularly on this question of the personhood of the Holy Spirit. So in terms of the way that we experience the Spirit, if there's been a critique, it's that we focus too much on the power gifts, the, um, the, the remarkable gifts, and perhaps in a way lose that sense of the personhood of the Spirit. We do think of the Spirit primarily in terms of a, a force or a substance or something like that. Um, your argument was that that's not necessarily the case because we do recognise other elements of the Spirit's person. Do you think that's a theological reality to recognise that, or is that also a practical, in-the-church reality where we also appreciate the person of the Spirit? Uh, when it comes to the relationship with God part of it, I think it's definitely there in you know grassroots Pentecostalism that the Spirit speaks and guides us and we... You know, we pray for the Spirit's direction, absolutely. So that sense of personhood, if we didn't regard, and by we I mean Pentecostals, regard the Spirit as a divine person, then we wouldn't uh, speak in such ways and expect to experience God by the Spirit in those ways. Um, but those those ideas are attention. But to be fair, there's they're in the Bible too, right? So we're trying to be biblical, and I think... We don't always work out those tensions, but neither do the biblical authors. So, um, our systematic theologians might like to figure them out, but maybe, maybe we don't have to. Uh, 